Uh, well, hello everyone. I'm Michael Levy. I'm one of the neurologists here at Massachusetts General Hospital. I am honored to be presenting to you today on the topic of the meteoroid trial. Meteoroid um, stands for is the basis of the uh, MOG trial with uh, a drug called satulizumab, and it is sponsored by Roche, which is a pharmaceutical company. And um, I'm not paid by the pharmaceutical company to give this talk or anything like that, but I, I do help with their trial design. And we do have a grant from them that comes to the hospital. So full disclosure there. All right, so the agenda is, um, we're gonna go through these slides fairly quickly and then we'll get into some questions. The topics are, what is MOG? That's gonna be a fairly quick um, overview. What is satralizumab and how might it help? And then um, we'll talk more about the trial and the trial design. So I think most of you are pretty familiar now with what MOG is, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody or antibody associated disease. It's an autoimmune disease. It lies somewhere on the spectrum between multiple sclerosis and NMO, neuromyelitis optica. It's similar in, to those diseases in that the immune system periodically attacks the optic nerves in the spinal cord and it leads um, problems with vision and problems with walking and bladder function, things like that. Also, MOG can um, involve the brain, especially in kids, and it causes seizures and changes in consciousness and things like that. So it, um, when it first um, comes on, it's very severe and the attacks are um, scary. And then we treat it and people tend to recover pretty well, but not always. The way MOG is diagnosed is we have official clinical criteria now. This means came together across many different countries and we hashed it all out. We said, okay, this is how you make the diagnosis. You have to have the following things. You have to have inflammation in the optic nerves, brain, or spinal cord. You have to have a doctor confirm that there is damage to the one of those areas from the inflammation. Um, so it can't just be that you feel something, but we can't see anything on exam. Although that tends to happen a lot. So our exams have to be very detailed. You have to test positive for the MOG antibody. That's a big deal because the test has to be done correctly. And sometimes it's negative. And we think that the patient has a disease. And so we might have to retest. And then the hardest part is ruling out diseases like MS, which don't have blood tests, sometimes requires spinal fluid analysis. We think we're pretty good at making the diagnosis now, I have to say. Um, the symptoms are pretty varied, but it relates to where the attack occurs. If the attack occurs in the optic nerve, you get vision problems. You might have pain with eye movement first, and then over three days, you get blurred vision, even loss of vision. It could look washed out. It could look like you're looking through um, uh, opaque glass or through water or something like that. If the attack occurs in the spinal cord, it's usually weakness numbness, and then during the healing process, spasticity. If it involves the lower part of the spinal cord, it can cause urinary retention, meaning you sit down or you're trying to pee and it doesn't come out. If it involves the brain, if the attacks occur in the brain, it can cause seizures. It can also change your level of consciousness. A lot of kids, when they get attacks, they'll um, you know, just stop, they won't wake up, or they'll be completely confused or something like that. It can be very scary at the onset. And then long-term, even with treatment, people with MOG tend to have fatigue and depression, maybe related to the damage that was done, but also maybe related to ongoing inflammation. The current treatments for MOG are all experimental, meaning nothing has been definitively proven. In science, we like to have a clear-cut answer. When we compare a drug, we usually compare to a placebo arm. Um, so we don't have that in MOG yet. We're working on it. That's one of the trials that I'll talk to you about today. But we do have experience with off-label drugs, off-label medications like um, high-dose corticosteroids, um, IV immunoglobulin or IVIG, and then plasma exchange, especially in the short term. For the long term, people still use rituximab a lot because we used to use it for aquaporin-4 disease. But it has it's not quite as good, maybe 30, 40% response rate. People sometimes use long-term steroids, but I try to avoid that because of the side effects. And then other immune suppressants like azathioprine or mycophenolate, uh, and I also like to use IVIG as well. 
Okay, so that's the whirlwind tour of MOG. There's probably a lot more um, to it, but and if you have questions, we'll address those. Uh, okay, now we're going to talk about satralizumab. Satralizumab, the brand name is Enspring. It is investigational in MOG, and that's the, the, the drug that we're testing in this trial. The drug blocks a protein called interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is a very pro-inflammatory molecule. If I injected IL-6 under your skin, you'd get a big rash, be very itchy and inflamed. You get a fever. It's very pro-inflammatory. So this drug just blocks whatever IL-6 would bind to, the IL-6 receptor. The drug is injected right under the skin, small needle, anywhere in your body, your belly, your leg, wherever, and it circulates far and wide. It's given once a month. Um, right now, it's experimental in MOG. It is approved for the NMO, Aquaporin 4 version of NMO, but it is not yet approved for MOG. There's nothing yet approved for MOG. Um, and really, the, the whole basis of this study is to definitively determine if this drug is useful in MOG or not. Um, there were two trials in NMO, and they both were positive. Both were helpful in Aquaporin 4 NMO. And they share some, like NMO and MOG and even MS, share some mechanisms of inflammation. So it's not unreasonable to think that it could be useful. And um, actually, the, the parent compound of satralizumab is something called tocilizumab or Actemra. And that has approvals in a lot of conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, temporal arteritis, a lot of other inflammatory diseases. It's investigated even in uh, syndromes. Um, in, in, even in cancer, where the treatment will induce an autoimmune response, tocilizumab is helpful there. So a lot of inflammatory conditions, and this is just the newer version. The newer version allows for fewer injections, so it lasts longer in the body. There are, of course, some safety risks with satralizumab. Anytime you suppress the immune response, anytime you block IL-6, for example, you're blocking a regular mechanism that the body uses to protect itself from bugs. Um, so that's the, the biggest deal. But then there are other, what are called off-target effects. So what are the off-target effects? Very commonly occurring in more than 10% of people, headache, injection reactions. Uh, in one study, there were no injection reactions. In another study, there were some. Um, and those are itching and rash, and they could last for a day or two. Um, diarrhea, joint pain. And then uh, one that you don't feel, but uh, we can detect on blood testing is a decreased white blood cell count. Then commonly, but not very common, meaning about one to 10% of people, you can see these side effects, muscle and joint stiffness, rash or itching, difficulty sleeping, things like that. And I'm not 100% sure how much of this is truly related to the drug versus happens in one to 10% of people Anyway, but there are a few things that are definitely linked to this drug and to the parent compound. For example, decreased level of fibrinogen needed for blood clotting. That is a class effect. We're aware of that from this drug and the previous drug. Same with this decreased white blood cell count. So those are really specific to this drug. And those are monitored, by the way. So anytime you're on this medication, those are the types of things we would monitor by blood tests. So the way that we're going to determine if this trial works is we're going to enroll people into the study, and um, we're going to blind everybody to the drug versus placebo. So half of the people will get placebo, half will get drug. I won't know what you're on. You won't know what you're on. The only person who knows what you're on is the pharmacist, and they don't let us talk to the pharmacists. So nobody knows what you're on. And it's randomly assigned. There's some computer somewhere that flips a coin, one or two, and then you get assigned to either the drug or the placebo, and then that's what you get during the course of the, what's called the experimental phase of the study. And during this experimental phase, we're going to see if this drug can prevent relapses. That's the whole point. So if you're on a placebo, you might relapse. And if you're on the drug, hopefully you don't relapse. And after a certain number of relapses in the study, we'll look back and we'll say, okay, did the drug prevent relapses? Here's a trial design picture. You can see people here are randomized at the beginning into either group A, which is the drug, or group B, which is the placebo. 
One nice thing about this study is if you're already on azathioprine or mycophenolate or low-dose prednisone, you can stay on that medicine. Even if you relapse on it, you can stay on it as sort of like an extra protection, extra help. And that's true whether you get assigned to either arm. So this plus minus IST is plus minus immunosuppressive therapy, and it's limited. You can only you can't be on anything. You can't be on IVIG, but you could be on azathioprine or mycophenolate. And then every couple of weeks, you know, we assess you, and then every month, except for this extra dose here, you get an injection. Uh, after a period of time, you can do them at home, but it does. Uh, I think it's after five or six injections. Becca knows um, for sure. If at any point you relapse during the study, we jump on it, we MRI you, we do all the tests, uh, we determine if it is a true relapse, and if so, we treat you as aggressively as we can. And then you have the option to enroll in what's called the open label phase, meaning we definitely know that you're getting the drug. There's no more blinded, there's no more, uh, you know you're getting the drug, I know you're getting the drug, everyone knows. And so then there's no more blinded phase there. The trial started in uh, 2022. I think it's enrolled maybe about half already, something like that. And it's expected to read out by next year. These are the inclusion criteria. You could be as young as 12 in the study. I think you have to be over 40 kilograms in body weight though. If you're, uh, if you're actually at any age, I think you have to be uh, a certain weight because the drug is dosed by weight. If you're over a certain weight, you get an extra dose. Uh, and if you're under a certain weight, then you're excluded. Uh, but the age does go down to as low as 12 years. You have to have had an attack at least one in the past year or two in the past two years. The reason is that, you know, with MOG, one of the neat things about MOG is that sometimes it can go away for a long period of time, even permanently in a lot of people. And so we don't want to treat those people and then just say, oh, yeah, the drug worked when they were really going to resolve anyway. So we want to make sure you have active disease that we can treat. So that's the reason for this inclusion criterion. You have to test positive to the MOG antibody, negative for aquaporin 4 antibody. You have to be excluded for MS, and that's kind of a clinical diagnosis. Uh, oh, body weight, at least 20 kilograms. Sorry, 20, not 40 kilograms. And um, you can't be on IVIG or other things. You can be on azathioprine. You can be on um, mycophenolate and low-dose prednisone, and that's it. When you're here and you're in the study, there's a lot of things that happen to you and a lot of testing that's all on this screen here. And this is done um, not every time. You know, you're not going to get an EKG every time. I think you get one at the beginning, and then maybe if you have a relapse or something like that. Of uh, cognitive tests and questionnaires and eye exams and neurological exams. It's a lot of attention. So if you like attention, you're going to like being in the study. Okay, and so this, this is the summary of it. Um, I, you, you already know what MOGAD is. So I really just gave you a summary of that. Satralizumab is maybe new to you. It's a blood drug that blocks the IL-6 receptor. It's being used in NMO. It's been used widely. It's especially popular in Japan, more than a thousand people in Japan and 2000 worldwide. And it's not yet approved for MOG, but that's what we hope to achieve here. And so that's the whole basis of the study. Back to you, Becca. Thank you. Now, I forgot to do the whole introduction at the beginning of this. So oh. I'm going this now and let people know where they can find the ask questions, et cetera. So. Hello everyone, welcome to um, this modcast that's called Michael on Meteoroid for MOGAD, um, Understanding the Satralizumab Clinical Trial. Today, Dr. Levy just did the presentation part of this, and we will be doing some questions and answers now. Um, as an intro for myself, my name is Gail Salki. Um, I'm the an advocacy specialist for the MOG project. Um, I'm a MOG patient, and I get to work with Dr. Levy at MGH, Mass General Hospital, where I act as the program manager um, for the neuroimmunology clinic. I helped start up this trial and the rosanalexizumab trial in MOG, um, and I don't work directly on them anymore, but I know a lot about them, so I'm excited to be here today talking with uh, Dr. Levy. 
about this study. Uh, this modcast is being recorded. It will be available on our website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel. Um, if you want to submit questions, please feel free to do so by commenting. Um, this is posted on Facebook, so comment on the Facebook live video. We will also be answering some community, we'll answer these community questions if time permits. Um, and any that are left over will be posted on a uh, MOG blog um, or in a future podcast. So stay tuned for that. A uh, little intro to Michael. Our he is an associate professor in neurology who was recruited to lead uh, the research unit in the new division of neuroimmunology at Mass General Hospital. His mission is to build a combined clinical and research neuroimmunology program to develop therapies for patients with autoimmune diseases of the central nervous system. Uh, Dr. Levy moved from Baltimore, Maryland, was on the faculty at Johns Hopkins University since 2009, and director of the Neuromyelitis Optica Clinic. Clinically, Dr. Levy specializes in taking care of children and adults with rare neuroimmunological diseases, including neuromyelitis optica, transverse myelitis, MOG antibody disease, and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. In addition to four monthly clinics, Dr. Levy is the principal investigator in several clinical studies and drug trials uh, for these conditions. So today we're here to have a little conversation and question and answer about satulizumab in MOG trials. Um, I think to start off, you had mentioned that the only difference between tocilizumab and Satra is is it just the time it stays in your body? Is everything else the same? Yeah, tocilizumab has two forms. It has an intravenous or IV form, and it has a subcutaneous form, whereas satulizumab is just subcutaneous, which I think is probably easier. Um, and it's a very small needle, so it goes right under the skin, super quick injection, and that's it. Um, and um, otherwise, they're pretty much the same. They're both weight-based. You have to have higher, you use higher doses um, for people who are heavier with both tocilizumab and satrolizumab. And um, satrolizumab just lasts a lot longer. So you don't need as frequent injections, um, things like that. Um, and you mentioned how it's been successful in aquaporin-4 NMO. A lot of other drugs that have been successful in aquaporin-4 aren't necessarily the best in MOG. Um, can you explain why you think that this one will be? Great question. Um, the truth is, when we first started treating MOG, we thought all the drugs would be equally effective, but they're not. And so that's really, it was surprising to us. And we kind of had to go back to the lab and try to understand why. It seems like aquaporin 4 NMO is much better, much more responsive to rituximab. And rituximab targets a B cell. It seems like without those B cells around, NMO really that seems to die down. And that's just not the case with MOG. So maybe B cells aren't as important in MOG. We, you know, the work we're doing in the lab now is looking at a different type of T cell I think is important. Uh, that has nothing to do with rituximab. So it's, a, it's interesting that the drug trials are informing us about the science. It should really be the other way around. We discover things in the lab and then bring them to the clinic. But we're learning a lot in the other direction. Right, and that's like why there are so many assessments and all this that goes on at the trial. True. There's a lot of data collection happening while they're obviously assessing to make sure the patients are safe. It's all helping in the long run. With now, I will say that we have some experience with the older version of satulizumab, tocilizumab, using that in MOG. They do a lot, um, use a lot of tocilizumab in Europe. And um, the Europeans were pretty keen on tocilizumab as a treatment. And we collaborated and sent all of our data to theirs put it all together. And it looked like it was really a potential option. And so we think that tocilizumab would work. And so by extension, satrolizumab could work. And the companies that, uh, the same company owns both, tocilizumab and satrolizumab. And right now they're willing to invest in satrolizumab. So that's the one we went with. I'm just seeing, looking. Question. I see Dana Yates, oh, asking, Basically, that question. Satulizumab and tocilizumab, very, very similar, just the dosing schedules. And if tocilizumab works for something, it's expected satulizumab would work, yeah. 
Okay, so some questions about entering the trial um, or qualifying. If a trial site isn't located where someone lives, um, can you explain sort of the process and if there are any costs incurred, things like that? I could probably ask you that question. You probably have a better answer than I would. My understanding is I do everything for the patient to try to get them here. We try to cover all costs, but uh, there are restrictions. Um, Becca, you know, if a patient is located within a certain distance, we've had experience even bringing people from California at one point. Uh, what, what's been your experience? Do you think that that's a feasible thing? I think it's a lot on everyone when you have to travel a long distance and it's a lot for the patients. Um, I think the best thing to do is getting a site as close as possible. Um, you, and it's, well, for this trial, they um, you can do home visits after, like you said, after the fifth dose. So that's sort of like the eighth visit because there are three, mm -hmm. three visits. Um, so once you can go home, that's a little bit better in this trial because you just take the med with you. Um, but you know there there are some restrictions um, to that being on a certain weight. Um, I yeah. don't know if you're far away it could be a, a restriction. We have had um, a patient from New Jersey come in, and it's about a what five hour drive, something like that, which isn't horrible. Um, but he is happy to be at home now doing the injections at home. Um, so yeah, it is, it is a burden. It's a lot to ask of patients, but sometimes it's the only option. I think there are eight sites in the U.S., if I'm not mistaken, Becca, do you remember how many sites there? Do we have a map? We don't have a map, do we? I think it's about eight or nine or 10 sites, maybe at the most, kind of spread out across population centers. Um, and in terms of cost, I was going to say that these trial costs are um, paid for by a like yeah. gift certificate. And um, travel is covered, right? Basically, for most people. So travel is covered, and that's sort of travel, and I think a lunch, um, and then if you have to stay overnight for any that's reason, covered too, right? And then don't they get a little stipend? just to kind of say thank you or just because taking time off of work? I don't know that I don't, no, I don't. Yeah, okay. Not a lot that there is. I don't think there's more stipend than the transportation and um, okay. like. Um, so this question is about if someone's having symptoms of a relapse or they've had worsening from their baseline condition, you know, their baseline, but they don't have those qualifiers for this is a definite relapse. No physician has said, I think you're, you've definitely relapsed, but they've progressed or gotten worse. Um, are they going to be eligible for the trial? Is that going to be like up to the, into the case by case basis? What, how will we look at? I think the first thing I would do as their physician is try to understand why they're getting worse. There must be a basis for that. If it's not a relapse, I'd want to try to find an explanation. Is it spasms and pain associated with healing? Is it a comorbid condition? Is it a medication side effect? It's got to be something that's making them worse. And sometimes it is a relapse. Um, you know, with, um, with MOG, as you know, if you MRI too early, you miss it. If you MRI too late, you miss the lesion. So sometimes we just miss the relapse, but it could be, you can make a, a diagnosis of a clinical relapse if it's really convincing that you're doing well, you're doing well, and then suddenly you do worse and you don't have a better explanation, especially if the MRI is not performed at the right time. So it can be a- And that can get challenged call. when people aren't doing well, doing well, doing worse. They might be like doing not so well, not so well, doing a little bit worse. And yeah. So Feel like a relapse when you're a patient it often does and it feels like the doctors aren't qualifying it as a relapse but in your subjective view it is so yeah you have to get another doctor on board to confirm a relapse for the study it doesn't have to be your doctor it could be any um you know qualified mog expert so if it let's say you're going to your local neurologist in a town that doesn't have a mog expert and that doctor doesn't feel like it's a true relapse 
you can always go to a main um, academic center where they have a mug expert and see what, what he or she thinks. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. We talked about most of these. I think there was a question in the chat about um, if you've been in a trial or one of the clinical trials already and you, would it be possible to switch from one trial to the other? Not a clinical trial. You you can. You need to wash out for six months, I believe. If you're in the Cosmog study with Rosanna Luxizumab, that has to be washed out for six months, and then you'd be eligible for satralizumab. The other way around, I don't remember, Becca. You might know better than me. If there's a washout period, I believe there is. Six months. Six months also. Now, once both drugs are approved then there's no requirement for a washout. They could be, they could overlap, um, especially while, while switching. So um, yeah, I, you know, someone made, made a joke about how, um, how difficult it is to pronounce Rosanna Lixizumab. I think they're gonna come out, they have come out with a brand name. Do you remember what it is? They came out for uh, Myasthenia Gravis already. It was yeah. just approved a couple of weeks ago. It has a decent name, not as hard as Rosanna Lixizumab. I've kind of learned to love it. Rosanna looks as a map. <laughs> it just um, rolls off the tongue. Um, I do see a couple other questions on the chat. Okay. Let's see. I'm on IVIG infusion for last four years, every four weeks. Do you think that this medication work if I went to a different country? How far? Uh, I can miss the medication. Um, well, so if you've been on IVIG for four years, I'm guessing you haven't relapsed in the past year or twice in the past two years. So you might not be eligible for the study. Now you don't wanna come off of IVIG just to relapse because you could suffer permanent damage. So we don't encourage that at all. If you're doing well on IVIG, stay on IVIG or maybe consider something else like mycophenolate. And then when these drugs are approved, then you should have access to the approved drugs. And can you talk a little bit more about that? Like the, you need two relapses. Yeah. So you need to have relapsing disease. You can't have just an initial optic neuritis, say three months ago, you test positive for MOG, and then you can't just jump into the study. You have to have at least two attacks. And the reason is that with MOG, a lot of people just have one attack and then it just goes away. And so we don't want to include all those people in the trial because then we'll need double as many people to see that scientific benefit. We want to exclude them. In order to do that, we require two relapses. Um, one has to be in the past two years, sorry, one in the past year or two in the past two years. Uh, right. And speaking of relapses, um, if you are in this trial and you have what you suspect some symptoms and think it's relapse, what happened to participants? If you have a relapse in the study, then first thing we do is we MRI you. We want to see what that relapse looks like. We examine you. We probably don't need to do spinal fluid. We do a bunch of blood tests. And then once we confirm that this is truly a relapse, we can treat you however we want. We can treat you with steroids, plasma exchange, IVIG. I love IVIG. And then you're out of the study um, in the, of the experimental phase. I can't tell you if you received the drug during that arm. I can't say, because I won't know. We're all blinded to it. We won't know till the very, very end of the study. But at that point, once you relapse, I can tell you that for sure, if you want the drug from then on, you can get the drug. And that's the open label phase. So when you get the drug, and I believe the assessments are fewer not as many blood tests and surveys, right, Becca? Um, uh, it's a little bit easier once you've relapsed. We're not going to be poking and prodding you and grilling you as many with as many questions as before. But yeah, then you get the drug every month until basically the end of the study, or as long as you wish. And will the relapse be treated as usual? Up to you or up to their other? It's totally up to your doctor, however they want to do it. If it's if it's a bad relapse and they want to be really aggressive, they can do that. And if it's pretty minor and they think they can get away with low dose steroids or something, then they can do that. So it's clinically adjustable. Clinically and if, 
body doctor that makes that decision or is it the person's main neurologist? Um, um, it's anybody that diagnoses the relapse. So if, let's say your neurologist, your hometown neurologist says, I believe you're having a relapse. I want to treat you. Yes. Start the treatment and no questions asked. And we'll ask a bunch of questions, but you know what I mean? We're not going to challenge it and say, no, 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 you can't get treated. We'd never do that. We do want you to come to the site so that a MOG expert can evaluate you too. But we would never tell your local doctor not to treat a relapse. That would be crazy. Let's see, I think there might have been. Did we get all the questions in the chat? I see a question. If you're past two years since the relapse, what are your options to use Satrimizumab? I can tell you it's very, very, very expensive. So it's hard to get off label. Insurance companies don't want to cover it if you're off point four negative. That's why we've been using tocilizumab. Tocilizumab is has a generic form now. It's still very expensive, but it is generic and it is a little bit easier to get. So the MOG people that I do have on this therapy um, off label are using tocilizumab. I know of one person whose insurance company is covering satrilizumab for MOG, and I still don't know how they did that. It happened. Um, okay, there's another question. Is it during the study, can patients administer the drug by themselves um, or do they have to have nurses do it? After the first, how many injections did you say? Five injections or five visits? Five, in uh, five injections. So five injections have to be done by us. And then after that, you can do your own injections. Uh, there's one little caveat to that. If you're in the study, and you're over 100 kilograms of body weight, that's 212 pounds, I believe, something like that, then you need a dose and a half. And to do the half is not that easy. So we have a nurse come to your house, give you the right dose, fill it up, fill up the syringe, and then hand it to you, and you can inject it yourself or have the nurse inject it. So little caveat for people over 100 kilograms of body weight. Okay. So are there any considerations for women or men that um, want to become pregnant, have a baby during the study if they need to make? We really don't want you to become pregnant during the study only because we don't know what the drug does during pregnancy. Not because we know that it's harmful, it's because we don't know if it's harmful. And so we just don't want it muddying the waters. Um, we're always scared about fetus and all the implications. So we beg you, please, please, please do not get pregnant. We, uh, I'm not sure if it's this study or the other one where we ask the partner to agree to it as well. Please, please don't get your partner pregnant. Um, and it's through abstinence or many other means that, that we accept, but we really don't want any pregnancies during this study, please. Um, how long after the trial completion is does it take to get FDA approval? Usually, I would say that in the, I'd say these days it takes probably a year or a year and a half. Now, for some of you who participated in the NMO trials, like for rabulizumab, you'll know it's been over a year and a half. And there are reasons for that. Sometimes the FDA wants a little extra of this or a clarification about that or they're auditing something and so it could take longer if the trial is pretty straightforward not too complicated like this one i really think within a year year and a half let's see there we can definitely list somewhere the centers uh i can find it in the newsletter um i know that there's a listing on clinicaltrials.gov it gives you by country Every site, I think there are 65 sites worldwide. I don't know about a map, but definitely a list on clinicaltrials.gov. And that has which ones are already active and all that too? It may not be totally, totally updated because they're still enrolling new sites, but I think there are at least eight listed for the US. <clears throat> um, do you anticipate this will be available in pre-filled injections like Actemra in the future? I do. I think, um, you know, we, it's already approved for NMO. It does come in pre-filled syringes. Um, I wish it would be like, a, you know, an auto injector. That would be nice. 
uh, just to make it a little easier, but I, and I'm sure they're working on it. Um, if someone's in the trial and it becomes too burdensome or difficult for them to do and they don't want to do it anymore, what happens? You can back out. Absolutely. And, it, and we'll have no ill will towards you. We've had a patient in the other study. He was 72 years old, flying from Albany, New York, every week to Boston and doing this for us, for the, for the sake of science, for the sake of the community. And when he bowed out, he was apologetic enough. No need to apologize. You did great. Thank you for six months of your participation. Anybody want to back out at any time? It's always respected. Uh, let's see. I guess we didn't come up with enough questions for for you. Not enough questions. Yeah. Uh, I see uh, one more on the website. On the um, is there active outreach to different ethnic groups, including Alaska Native, Native Americans who have, who have to use Indian Health Service? I can tell you that just generally getting a broad representation of the disease across race, sex, age, and country is a priority. And I, I would imagine an Alaska Native would be very high priority because we probably would get one in the trial. Uh, maybe. And so we, you know, with so few treated, it's hard to know if a drug really works or not in a certain patient population unless you have enough people. So I would imagine that there is priority there. What is the active outreach at the moment? Uh, Becca, I know you're working with another company on that. I don't know about this one. Yeah, I'm not working with this one on that. I can't speak to that, but we are we are working with some other companies on this. Yeah, other every every company has their own um, sort of priorities about how they want to try to um, bring in other ethnic groups. There's also a big challenge about what is a true ethnic group. You know, you might say, "Well, my mom is this and my dad is that," so what does that make me? And it may be more accurate instead of classifying yourself to classify your parents. Uh, because these days there's just a lot of mixing. And so that's something I know, Becca, you're working on. Um, and even just the number of different ethnic categories we're expanding. It's not just black, white, Native American anymore. It's now like a full list because there could be a lot of differences in, in, in different populations. Okay. And can you... Um... Well, we can just like talk a little bit about what a clinical trial visit is like, how long they, um, in my experience, it was, you know, screening, the screening period is one long screening day, very long day, MRI, um, all the physical assessments, um, not the questionnaires, that makes it a little bit shorter, but blood draws, things like that. Um, then there's a a visit, a baseline visit a month later, if you're eligible and go through all that, about a month later, there's a baseline visit, which is also a, a very, very lengthy visit because it has all the questionnaires plus the dosing, a little, a few more assessments. Um, there's just a lot more going on that day and you have to stay for a few hours after the first uh, injection. For observation, I think it's 45 minutes or an hour. I'm getting the two trials confused now. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, you hang out with us for a little bit. Yeah, I think maybe for the first dose, it's actually two hours. So anyway, it's a long day, that first visit, a uh, drug visit. And then there's another visit two weeks later, because the first you get injections two weeks apart instead of a month. So there's really three visits in that first month, plus the screening the month before. So there's a lot going on, especially at the beginning of the trial. And it's, it's a lot of um, So I think people have to sort of be aware of that, um, know that you're gonna be hanging out at the trial sites for, you're gonna get to know the people there very well. Yeah. Um, I do see a question in the chat about how many participants will be in the study. I believe it's 150 or 152. Is that right? There are, one study is 104 and one is 152. Yeah, I think 104 is rosemab. 
if I'm not mistaken. I think that sounds right. So there's still plenty of room. I think they're, like I said, about half full and um, they are on target to finish the study on time, but that presumes that we'll continue to have the interest among our patient population to do this. I would say that the biggest hurdle, the biggest problem with both trials is the placebo risk, because you know going in that there's a 50-50 chance you won't get the drug. You'll get a saline, sugar pill, whatever, and so you, it might not work, for you, obviously, you might have a relapse, and it could have it could have devastating consequences. Eighty plus percent of attacks recovered uh, back to baseline once they're treated. So we don't think that's a huge risk, but it is a partial risk. And think about it yourself: if you already have compromised vision in one eye, and you're worried about vi losing vision in the other eye, it could be a little bit of a leap of faith to enroll in a study where you do get a placebo, there's a chance that you could get placebo. Um, now, after a single attack, there's no more risk. You get the drug for sure. So some people look at it as a kind of uh, investment. You put this uh, time in, and if you relapse, then you get the drug for sure. And some people just want to contribute to the science. They say, oh, we're already you know, 50s, 60s, whatever. I just want to make sure for future generations that there's something good for them. And that's, so there's a lot of different motivations for people to participate, but I would say that the biggest hurdle is that risk of placebo. And what do you think, you said earlier that it, it's, it's for patients who don't really have other options. Um, is, are there other groups of patients that would benefit from enrolling in a clinical trial? Yeah, um, you know, we try not to take it advantage of anybody, but sometimes people's insurance companies don't cover IVIG. IVIG is very, very expensive. And insurance companies are, are really cold and heartless sometimes when they say this drug is not effective and it's never been proven and so we're not going to cover it. Um, so for a lot of people, if they fail azathioprine or microphenolate, they really don't want to stay on prednisone their whole lives. Nobody does. Then um, sometimes they will participate in the study because it's not their only option, but it's their next best option. And of course, we do have access to tocilizumab most of the time. And whereas satrolizumab, may, it's about a third of the cost of satrolizumab, but still pretty darn expensive. And sometimes insurance companies don't cover that. Um, so a lot of times it is financially motivated, but we try not to do that. We really, really try almost every case where I'm sitting face to face with a patient and I'll say, let me try to get a good treatment for you first. And I battle the insurance companies and we fight and sometimes I lose. And then the clinical trial might be the next best option. Um, have, has anyone that you've seen experienced on this drug experienced any extreme side effects or anything more than what you'd I use it for NMO, alcohol for NMO. I use it for MOG. I use tocilizumab for, um, for MOG and for seronegative disease. I have not seen any major side effects. There was one case, you know who you are, you might be on the Facebook now, who had what seems like a MOG attack while on tocilizumab. And there was a, a question about whether it was a true MOG attack or a side effect of the drug. And I really think it was a MOG attack. So that's a true failure. The drug did not prevent that MOG attack. But there was a question for a while about whether the drug induced the attack or not. And I don't think that's the case. Other weird side effects? Have you heard of any, Becca? Nothing so far. Um, there have been any things going on well for the patients? Have you heard any feedback from patients in the trial? Yeah, of course they don't know if they're getting drug or not, right? Do we have anyone in the open label phase yet? I think uh, they're all in the, wait. Uh, no, we don't have anyone in open label, do we? They're still all in the blinded phase, meaning yeah, they seem happy because they have relapsed and they think they're getting the drug, but they don't know, and I don't know. So everyone seems to be happy as long as no one's relapsing. 
and and it seems to be tolerable if they are getting the drug. Um, I haven't seen really any side effects, right? No headaches yet, um, really nothing. And that's been our experience with the NMO, with the Aquaporin for uh, patients who are using sexualism, very, very few side effects. Any other, um, let's see, you have another question. Any forecast trials of tolerance treatments? Yes, and we wanted to ask some about your clinical research, so. Yeah, we are doing a lot of thinking about tolerization for MOG, but we're not quite sure exactly how to do it yet, which approach we should use. But the idea there is instead of suppressing, <clears throat> instead of suppressing a whole arm of the immune system, we would just try to re-educate the immune system. That's the basis of tolerance. In the same way that your immune system got turned on to attack MOG, we want to just turn that off. So it stops attacking just MOG, not, not block a whole part of your immune system. So we're doing that in the lab. There are a lot of ways that we can effectively do it in the lab in mice. We can make mice with um, MOG antibody disease and then turn it off. Uh, but translating that to people has been a little bit more challenging. But we're working on that. That is the holy grail of neuroimmunology uh, research at the moment. <clears throat> Um, real quick, just going back to that pregnancy question, um, is breastfeeding allowed or people who just had kids, like, do you know what the timeline is? put that one back on you, Becca. I'm going to go. That's, why I'm... That's exactly the kind of question I would ask you. I'd be like, hey, Becca, patient wants to know if she can breastfeed during the study or, you know. I don't know if there's a list of inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, and we would have to go through that very carefully. Yeah. I'm sorry, I do not have the answer either. I my sense is probably no breast no breastfeeding, right? That's my guess. The truth is, a lot of these medications, um, including the ones we use for NMO, there's a little bit that's secreted in the breast milk, and most of that gets broken down in the baby's stomach. The baby's stomach breaks down almost all IgGs. It's only IgAs that survive. And those are protected and then absorbed and used by the baby. But IgGs are generally not dangerous to babies. Having said that, if something does go wrong, then it becomes a really, really big deal and the FDA starts auditing and asking questions. So generally, companies don't want to trigger anything that can put their drug at risk. That's the truth. Um, oh, yeah, you answered this. Let's do it again because I think it was meant by a few people. Um, how long for FDA approval again? I would give it about a year, year and a half after the trial is closed. Um, so if this drug go, this trial goes to twenty twenty five, let's say June twenty twenty five, and I would give it till next June twenty twenty six through the end of the year. That's kind of my expectation. Great. If there are any more questions, please drop them into the chat. Um, let's see. Dana wants to say thank you. Happy to do thank this. You thank you for tuning in, everybody. Um, yes, and thank you, Dr. Lee, um, for your time, your commitment to the MOG community. We are all very appreciative. Um, and anyone watching or anyone that'd like to check out more, look at the uh, website, and as well as the Neuroimmunology Clinic's website. Um, do you remember? It is MOG. Oh, what's our website? We'll have Julie post it. Um, Anyway, that has on it all the work that we are doing at the clinic, all the trials we're working on, all the other research studies and a lot of work that's being done. So exciting things happening over there. Um, and we also have an Instagram page you can follow. But okay, that's it. That's it for us. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks everyone.